One particular type of distribution that's oftentimes used is the normal distribution. This is the most well-known distribution. The normal distribution has the property that um, it is very well understood. And so we're going to use it as an example as well. So for a normal distribution, um, your expected return is in the center. So for the large company stock, the expected return is 11.8%. In the normal distribution, 68%, so you see this gray area, 68% of the time, you can expect your outcome to be between plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation. So if you look at the large company stock, remember that the average is 11.8% and the standard deviation is 20.3%. So we have the average here of 11.8%. So plus one standard deviation means that we take the average, 11.8%, plus the standard deviation. Remember the standard deviation is 20.3%. So when you add 11.8 to 20.3, you have 32.1%. So that's what we mean by plus one standard deviation. And you get the same from here. To get minus one standard deviation, we take 11.8% minus one standard deviation, which is 20.3%. And that gives us minus 8.5%. And that is minus one standard deviation. So that's how we come up with minus 0.85% and 32.1%. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? That tells us that 68% of the time when you invest in a, in, in a large company stock, your return will be somewhere between minus 8.5% and plus 32.1%. So we already know that it's highly unlikely we'll get exactly 11.8%. But now we can ask richer questions. What are the chances of us losing 10%, for example? Uh, or what are the chances of making more, doubling our money, meaning making 100%? We can use this to help us answer those questions. So we know that 68% of the time, our return will be somewhere between losing 8.5% and gaining 32.1%. Next, let's take a look at the pink area. The pink area here includes the center as well. That is the 95%. The 95% corresponds to plus two standard deviation and minus two standard deviation. So plus two standard deviation means that we take the expected return, which is 11.8%, plus two times the standard deviation, so two times 20.3%. So that means 11.8% plus 40.6%, and that gives us 52.4%. So that's how this comes about. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now and think about, well, how would we get minus 2 standard deviation? Welcome back. Did you get 11.8% minus 2 times 20? 2.3% and that gives you 11.8% minus 40.6% and that gives you minus 28.8%. So that's how you come up with the plus 2 standard deviation. You can now go ahead and compute plus 3 standard deviation or minus 3 standard deviation. So those are the boundaries that help us interpret um, the, a normal distribution. So let me clear this graph a little bit so that allow us to go back and really look at what does these numbers mean now that we know how to get those numbers. So what this tells us is that 68% of the time, our return is going to be somewhere between minus 8.5% and 32.1%. And 95% of the time, our return is going to be somewhere between minus 28%, 28.8% and 52%. So if 95% of the time I'm going to be between these two boundaries, that means 5% of the times I'm going to be outside of those boundaries. So that means 2.5% of the times I'm going to be higher than 52%, and 2.5% of the time 
means I'm going to be less than minus 28.8%. So if I ask, what are the chances of me making more than 50%, for example? That would say about 2.5% of the time. When you, you may want to ask, well, what are the chances of me losing more than 30% of my investment? Well, based on this distribution, we'll say that's going to that's be less than 2.5%. So your chances of losing more than 30%, so your chances of losing more than 28.8% is 2.5%. So your chances of losing um, more than 30% is going to be slightly less than 2.5%. You can do the same interpretation using the 99% uh, confidence interval. The 99% confidence interval is corresponding to the 3% or uh, 3 standard deviation. So if 99% of the time your return is going to be between minus 49% and plus 72%, that means you only have 1% chance of lying outside of those. So half of 1% you're going to be having a huge return of more than 70%. But there's also a half percent chance, relatively low chance, that you lose more than 49%. So what are your chances of losing half of your investment? It's less than half a percent in large company stock. But you are not going to be easily doubling your money because the chances of you doubling, meaning earning 100% on your investment, is much, much less than half a percent. So this is how we can use standard deviation combined with probability distribution to help us um, analyze and estimate, wrap our mind around what uh, what risk is associated with our investment. A lot of times we also focus on the extreme events. So here is uh, some extreme events. These are, these are the record one day loss. Um, most of us probably remember the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, that registered in two of the top um, 12 event dates. So it is definitely a historic moment. But compared to what happened in the 1920s and the 1930s, um, those are actually not as bad. Um, and the reason why they are not as bad is because since the 19, um, there are a lot of financial regulation implemented after 1920s um, that helped stabilize the financial market. Um, each time there's a financial crisis, there are new financial regulation put in place, um, and they they did a really really good job of stabilizing the financial market. But what happened is once the financial market is stabilized, then people forget, and then they will want to deregulate the financial crisis. And following it, and it almost happened every single time following deregulation. It doesn't happen right away, but eventually another financial crisis will hit, and then there will be a new round of regulation. Um, we are at a, a, we are we are more than a more than ten years from our last financial crisis, and now we have once again into the face of people wanting to deregulate. And if deregulation go too much, then there will be another financial crisis down the road. This is this is this has happened over and over again in American financial market history. So uh, it's hard to it's hard to control people's emotion. I talk about uh, behavioral finance a lot. Um, people people's um, oftentimes is incapable of learning from history. So even though we can see this um, occurring over and over again, uh, history continues to repeat itself in the financial market. Lastly, I want to introduce a, um, a third measure of return, and this is called the geometric average return. The reason why geometric average return is important is because the arithmetic average return does not take into compounding. So what that means is the average, the arithmetic the arithmetic average return actually overstate um, what your expected return would be had you invested in the stock market or any other investment, and you keep the money in that in, in, in your investment and allow compounding to occur. So it's useful to also compute geometric average return. Uh, this is a more useful return for an investor for your own personal assessment. Uh, unfortunately, most financial um, firms do not publish their geometric average return. So the way that we compute geometric average return is we take we take one plus the return each year, 
and then we multiply it. So instead of adding it, we multiply 1 plus the return. And instead of dividing it by the number of time period, we take it to the teeth root. So, and then we subtract the final product by 1. We're going to go over an example demonstrate how this works. So let's say this is our return for the past uh, from the year 1926 through 1930. So first I want you to go ahead and compute the arithmetic average return. So pause your video and do that. Welcome back. Now we are going to compute the geometric average return. So remember we're going to take 1 plus that number. So 1 plus 11.14% will be 1 plus 0.114 times 1 plus 0.3713 and then times 1 plus 0.4331 times 1 plus, but this is negative, so we're actually subtracting 0.891%, uh, and then we'll subtract 25.26%. So we're going to multiply all of this together, and then we have five years, so we'll take it to the fifth root, so 1 over 5, and then subtract 1. Um, here I have combined the addition together, so the additions are easy. So 1 minus 0 0.0891 it becomes 0 0.989109, and 1 minus 0 0.2526 becomes 0 0.7474. And when you multiply this together, um, what you would do instead of taking it 1 to the fifth, 1 divided by 5 is 0.2. So you can take the, the product raised to the 0.2 power. And then you subtract 1. We get our geometric average return of 8.26%. Now, how does that compare to the arithmetic average? As you can see, the geometric average return is much smaller than the arithmetic average return. Uh, this is obviously an extreme example because the return is very, um, it, it, the changes or the, var the variation is extremely great. In fact, the geometric average return is almost always less than the arithmetic average, is less than or equal to. Um, the only time that they are equal is when there's no variation. So if the return is the same each year, then the geometric average and the arithmetic average will be the same. But if there is variation in the return, then the geometric average will always be less than the arithmetic average. And the greater the variation, the greater the difference between the two. So we can take a look at the difference between the geometric and the arithmetic average between the different types of securities. So you can see for something that's very, very low, well, that has very, very low volatility, such as UST bill, the geometric average return and the arithmetic average return is almost the same. For something that has a very high volatility, such as the stocks, you will see that the difference is much, much, much greater. So how do we choose between using arithmetic versus geometric means? Um, here are some rule of thumbs that you can use. Um, in general, the arithmetic average is overly optimistic, meaning that it's too big for long horizons. So if you are planning for long horizon, the geometric mean is a better measure of what your actual outcome will be. On the other hand, the geometric average is overly pessimistic for short horizons. So our recommendation is it really depends on how you're going to be using the, um, the, planning, uh, the planning horizon. If your planning horizon is between 15 to 20 years or shorter than that, um, we recommend using the arithmetic mean. So for most projects, um, Typically, a project life is between three to five years, at most ten years. So the arithmetic mean will be a very uh, will be a good average to use. Um, if it's sometime between twenty or forty years, you may want to split the difference if the difference is big. Uh, so if you're planning of retirement, depending on your current age, if it's more than forty years, then we recommend using the geometric average. Thank you.